start our discussion on nucleic acids and their components. Before we understand what nucleic acids are, so far we have studied all the other molecules basically for life. Molecules for life meaning the carbohydrates, the lipids that form the cell membranes and other components basically amino acids and proteins. Now when we go on to nucleic acids, we will see how important they are in their manifestation in the formation of the proteins that we have studied so long. Okay? Now when we look at the central dogma of biology, which goes as follows, it is DNA to RNA to protein. This is known as the central dogma of biology. Going from DNA to RNA, the process known as transcription, RNA to protein is the process known as translation. And we know that all the information is stored in the DNA, that is our storage medium. It is then formed or rather transcripted to RNA forming the transmission medium that then forms the protein expressing a protein is what we mean by this protein formation that ultimately is required in all the activities that go on in the body in terms of enzymes and so on and so forth. What we are going to do in nucleic acids is we have looked at some of the components, but we will see how the structures are related and how actually some of these processes are going through. So if we look at just some idea of the biological length scale, we have looked at chemical bonds, something that you have looked at for a long time now. They are in the order of angstroms. If we look at amino acids, they are in the order of tens of angstroms. When we look at proteins, they are in the order of hundreds of angstroms. Okay? And as we go higher and higher, you see how this length scale actually goes on and ends at DNA, which is actually 10 centimeters, which is pretty long if you look at it from a protein point of view. Considering that you have a globular protein that is in still in the angstrom realm, where you have it in the order of 100 angstroms. We have a chromosome DNA that is around 10 centimeters. Now, the fact that you have DNA replication, DNA processing going on extremely fast in the body, it is extremely important to understand how structurally it is placed in the body, how it is located and what holds the two, as we will study later on, the two strands of the double helix together. Now, this is something we have looked at before when we were doing vitamins and coenzymes. We consider what are called nucleotides. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid and RNA is ribonucleic acid. Now, in the formation of these RNA and uh, these nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, there are certain terminologies that we have to go through once more to understand their structure, their bonding. In nucleotides, we have what is called a nitrogenous base, a sugar and a phosphate. We now know what a sugar is, you all know what a phosphate is and we will just breeze through what a nitrogenous base is. Now when we consider these nitrogenous bases, there are two types of bases that we consider, purines and pyrimidines. This is something that we considered when we did vitamins and coenzymes. But just to revise what we had studied there, when we consider these nucleic acids therefore, we have the sugar and phosphate which is actually called a sugar phosphate backbone. Okay? Now the primary structures of both DNA and RNA are similar. They have a sugar phosphate backbone. The difference is in the type of sugar because one is a ribose sugar and one is a deoxyribose sugar. Now the difference again also lies in the type of base that is attached to the ribose or the deoxyribose ring. Okay? So what we have is we have a phosphate that is shown in yellow here, the sugar that is shown in blue and we have different kinds of bases depending on the nucleic acid that is attached to the sugar. Okay? So what we have basically is a sugar phosphate backbone and we have the bases attached to the sugars 
in the backbone. The sugars that are used in these two types of nucleic acids are ribose. Ribose is used in RNA and the essential difference between ribose and deoxyribose is the missing OH at the two prime position of the sugar ring in DNA. Okay? So, when we have this linkage, this 5 end will attach to a phosphate, this end will attach to a base and the bases will be different, the sugar is essentially different. When we link these together as we will see, we will have RNA, if we link these together, we will have DNA. Okay, and there is a basic difference between the structure and this is also going to be reflected in the stability of RNA and DNA. So, we have the nucleic acids that are made up of polymers of four different nucleotide residues. We will see what these are in a moment. We have A, C, G, U that makes up the alphabet of RNA and A, C, G, T that makes up the alphabet of DNA and because the ribose sugar is in its deoxy form, we have this small d prefixed to the AMP, CMP, GMP and TMP. Okay? By default, if you write AMP, it is a ribose sugar. You have to specify the deoxy type of the sugar by writing the small d, which means that at the 2 prime functional group, you do not have the OH attached to it. So, what are these base families? We have the nitrogenous bases, purines. What are these purines? They are fused 6 and 5 membered rings, a hetero carbon nitrogen ring system and the two commonly used ones in DNA and RNA are adenine and guanine. These are the purines. The pyrimidines are 6 membered carbon nitrogen rings that are usually unsaturated and there are three common purines that are found in biological systems. C and T are used in DNA that is cytosine and thymine, cytosine and uracil are used in RNA. Okay? So, we have the purines and the pyrimidines that are going to form the nitrogenous bases of the nucleotides that are going to be attached to the sugars in the nucleotide structure to form our nucleic acids. So, these are our purines and pyrimidines. These are the definite structures. This is the numbering system that you have for purines, the numbering system that you have for pyrimidines. Okay? And as we mentioned before that when we are looking at DNA, we have A, G, C and T. When we have RNA, we have A, G, C and U instead of T. So, these are our different base families. Now, this is something that we looked at before. When we are forming the nucleotide, we have our sugar. The sugar in this case is a ribose sugar because the OH at the 2 prime position is present. We have a beta N glycosidic bond, we know why it is beta, we know why it is glycosidic and we know why it is N. Right? Why is it beta? Because it is cis to the CH2OH. Why is it N? Because it is linking with the N of the purine or the pyrimidine base. Why is it glycosidic? Because you are linking a sugar. Anytime you link a sugar, it becomes a glycosidic linkage. Okay? So, this is a beta N glycosidic linkage that is linking the sugar ring to the purine or the pyrimidine base at the 1 prime position. At the 2 prime position, you have either OH or you have H being either a ribose sugar or a deoxyribose sugar. Then you have the phosphate attached to the 5 prime where you have either just one phosphate or you can have three phosphates as we looked at the structure of AT. So, we have when we have the OH, we have the ribose, when we have just the H, we have the deoxyribose and we know how to designate these by writing either a small d or without the d, 
when we want to specify a ribose sugar. So, when we have just the base and attached to the sugar, we have a nucleoside. As soon as the phosphate is attached to the 5 prime position, we have a nucleotide. Okay? So, we have our nuclear base and adenine, we have a nucleoside which is the base attached to the sugar. The sugar in this case is 2 prime deoxy which means there is just the H here, there is no O. Then we have our nucleotide which is 2 prime deoxy adenosine 5 prime monophosphate, but I could have just written this as D. AMP. Okay? Just writing it as DAMP, you know that this is the structure. Okay? The D signifying no OH here, the A signifying this and the MP signifying, signifying the monophosphate. Okay? So, each of these, so the DAMP, you know exactly how you have to write it. Even for the DCMP or the D A AMP, ATP, whatever, you know how to write it. Okay? Now, considering that we have the sugar and the phosphate attached to one another and we have these bases basically sticking out, okay, that is what I showed you in the first picture. So, it means that we have to look at some conformational configurations, conformational considerations in terms of the backbone, just like we had in the protein. What did you have in the protein? You had certain phi psi angles that mentioned how the backbone would be oriented and we had what did we have sticking out from the backbone? The side chains, the different R groups were sticking out from the amino acid C alpha groups of the backbone and we had different orientations possible. We can have the same here. Okay? What is that? So, this backbone of RNA and DNA consists of the alternating phosphate ribose or deoxyribose, 2 prime deoxyribose chain. We understand that now. Okay? So, we have alternating phosphate and ribose. We will see how that is formed once we understand the torsional angles. Now, when we have conformational variation, this arises from you understand restricted bond rotations. Okay? Now, where are we going to get restricted bond rotations? We have a sugar ring. Okay? We have single ring. What do we have? We have something like this. This is our sugar ring. Now, you have to remember all of these are single bonds. So, what is possible? Puckering is possible. We do not call this rotation because it is restricted in its rotation. If we have just a single bond, we know that we can rotate all the way through. But when we have something like this, you cannot have this go all the way through because it is going to twist the molecule. This twisting is what is known as puckering. So, what, what kind of observations can we have? We can have the oxygen go up, go down with respect to this bond here. Right? So, what we can have is we can have restricted bond rotations within the sugar ring because we have a ring system. We are, we are not free to rotate all through. This gives rise to different ribose ring pucker okay, and torsional angles at bonds that connect the phosphate to the ribose. Now, let us see what we mean by that. This is what we mean. We have here just look at one of these figures first. This red sphere is the oxygen of the sugar ring. Okay? We have a five membered sugar ring. So, if we just look at the different, so this is 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. These are the five atoms that we have connected to form the five membered ring. This is the 5 prime carbon atom that is usually attached to the phosphate. Okay? See, this is what we are looking at. We have something like this. This is attached to the phosphate and where is this attached? This is attached to the 
base right so and this is our 2 prime this is our 3 prime I mean, this is our 2 prime and this is our 3 prime position fine this is our 1 prime this is our 4 prime and this is our 5 prime so now when we go back to this we recognize what is happening here we have 1 what is this attached to the base so the blue circle represents the base nitrogen that it's attached to we remember that this is a n glycosidic bond so the sugar is attached to the base by the nitrogen it is beta because these are cis to one another fine so we have the phosphate or rather let's look at the 5 prime carbon for now so we have basically the 5 prime carbon here which is essentially attached to the phosphate and we have the base now we're looking at what can happen to the sugar ring the sugar ring can bend in such a way that we can have something that is called 2 prime endo 3 prime endo and o 4 prime endo now if you look at each of these structures you will see that the bond or rather the atom that is forming the endo conformation is getting close or rather in the same direction as the phosphate and the base when you have the 2 prime end pucker up to be cis to the phosphate and the nitrogen you have a 2 prime endo if the 3 prime sticks up toward in the same direction as the base and the phosphate you have a 3 prime endo if the oxygen sticks up in the same direction you have an O 4 prime endo is that clear okay so the endo configuration is when you have some carbon atom or the oxygen atom push to a position or pucker to a position that is in the same direction as the base attachment and the phosphate attachment okay only if these are in the same positions would you have what is called an endo conformation so you would have the opposite if you had an exo you can have a 3 prime exo which would mean that the 3 prime carbon is away from the phosphate and the nitrogen the 2 prime exo means that you would have the 2 prime carbon away from the phosphate and the base okay so now if you look at just the way if you trace the numbers here or we just trace the carbon here if we go down this way then up this way and down this way you are basically tracing a letter s this way okay so you are going down this way because you are say 3 prime endo then you are going up at 3 prime coming down again okay so what you are looking at is you are looking at what is called an s twist the twist is such that you can just imagine twisting the wire if you just connect wires where you have one as an oxygen then you connect these wires you just twisting it in such a way that you have an s twist you can twist it in the opposite direction that is going to give you what is called an n twist okay so if you just trace the atoms here we will have in this case when we have the 3 prime endo and we follow the direction from this carbon up we have this this and this what is it tracing something like the letter n if we go in this way the 2 prime exo we would have this up down again up again tracing something that looks like the letter n so this is why there are just two names given to this called the s twist and the n twist okay so this is how we represent the sugars in the now this is important because now if you look at the orientation of the phosphate and the nitrogen there is a slight change in how the bases are connected okay 
Now, how is the, we are we'll going to see how this is going to help later on in the overall structure, okay? because basically we are going to have a polymerization, a polymer formation. Now, based on the orientations of the sugar rings and their conformational considerations, you can position the base. Now, the reason why we need to the position the base is to form favorable interactions. Okay? So, this is what we have. We have now here a dinucleotide. Why do I call this a dinucleotide? Because I have two nucleotides. You recognize here that you have this red we know is the oxygen of the sugar. This is the nitrogen of the base. This is the other sugar. And what do we have here? We have this again. This is the 5 prime that is linked to the phosphate. This is the phosphate. Okay? Try and recognize this. So, we have a 2 prime. Does the 2 prime have the oxygen? Does it have the oxygen? It does not have the oxygen. So, what is this? It is a deoxyribose. Okay? Now, we are just going to look at this for torsional configurations because now we know that when we have a single unit, okay, let us consider a single unit. When we have, so this is one unit here, okay, the top this is one unit and this is another unit, right. We have linked these two units together. We will see how they link together later on, but we have to first understand how actually the conformational considerations are going to play an important role. Now, what we have learned from the previous slide is we can have puckering in this sugar ring, right, and also in this sugar ring. Now, due to the puckering, what is going to happen? The positions of this phosphate and the positions of the base are going to change, right. The positions of, because see this is the overall backbone. If this is the overall backbone, we can have positional changes due to the ring puckering. We can also have positional changes due to rotations about this bond and this bond. Remember the phi psi angles of proteins? Okay? Now, if we just consider that we have the sugar, the phosphate, the sugar, the phosphate. We have here single bonds. What do single bonds allow? They allow free rotation. Okay? And because of this rotation, we can have again changes in the position of the bases and the position of the phosphate. What, can, what happens if I rot, rotate about this psi angle? the base is going to come up all the way on the other side, right. So, what is going to happen if I rotate about this? This base can shift, right. So, we have an alpha rotation and we have a xi rotation, a eta rotation rather, okay. So, we have to now the reason why we are looking at this is if we look at the previous slide what happened here is you had changes in the orientation of the bases why because of the puckering due to the sugar what is that doing that is changing the position or the orientation of the base and also the phosphate but you can also have rotations about these two angles. What is that going to lead to? You? That is also going to lead to changes in the positioning of the bases. The changing in the positioning of the bases is going to help in the bond formation that we are going to see later on. Okay. Now, we have to look at another xi angle. This is the xi angle. Now, what we are looking at here is 
what is this? Is this a nucleoside or a nucleotide? It is a nucleoside, why? Because it does not have the phosphate attached to it. It has the base attached to the sugar. Now you have to remember again we have a single bond here. So what is possible? Rotation about the bond is possible. Okay. This is a syn orientation. Okay. Because we have the made this in the purine case we have the six membered and the five membered rings fused to one another right and when you have a syn orientation you have the base and the pentose that is this part of the sugar on the same side. It is anti when it goes on the other side. Okay. Now this rotation is also possible. So you what we are getting at is we are getting since we have to study nucleic acid structure and its components we are looking at all the different structural aspects possible. And these structural aspects are possible because you have these single bonds, these single bonds allow rotation and the sugar ring allows puckering. Okay. So all this put together is going to get this into a very, very flexible structure, but the structure in a sense is not that flexible as we will see later on. Okay. So what we have is we can have syn adenosine or we can have anti adenosine where we have the sugar ring and the base away from the pentose sugar. When we have the purine nucleosides, we have an anti configuration when this oxygen is away from this part, we can have the syn orientation when there is rotation about this and this oxygen comes above this part. Okay. So, usually the pyrimidines uh, adopt this anti configuration because we are obviously going to result in some steric clash if this oxygen comes here and then we again we have a phosphate attached to this and so on and so forth. Okay. So, we would rather have an anti orientation, but this since this allows rotation it may be possible that in some cases you might have a syn orientation also. Okay. Now, before we get into how these are formed we need to look at the structure of ATP once more. Okay. What we, we looked at, what is this now? When, as soon as we attach this phosphate, it becomes a nucleotide. Okay. So, now that we have the nucleotide, we have an alpha position, a beta position and a gamma position. Okay. This is the alpha phosphate that forms AMP. When we have the phosphorylation here also, it is A. DP, right? Then when we have it at the gamma position as well, it is ATP. So we have AMP, ADP, and ATP. Okay. Now we're going to see how we can actually form these. Now we are synthesizing a nucleic acid polymer. Okay. Essentially, what we have is we have something like this. We have this is our sugar. What do we have attached at this position? A base. What do we have? We have something else attached here. If we have the phosphate, then we have a nucleotide. We have the OH here and we have this here. So, what is this? Deoxy. Now, we have ATP. ATP means I have O here. I have what I have, what do I have, ha have here? I have A basically here, OH here. This is then what? The ATP, right? Then I have O, P, O, P. So, what do I have? I have D, A, T, P. O, O minus, O minus. So, I have one part here and ATP here. 
what is happening now is this lone pair attacks this phosphate. Okay. So, what we have is this lone pair attacking this phosphate. What am I going to form then? What is going to happen? I am going to have what am I going to have here? If we had this A here, this oxygen is now linked to this phosphate. right this oxygen is now linked here and we have this part released so what have i essentially done i have linked this with this right where have i linked it at this position what is this position? The 5 prime position. So, 3 has gone to the 5. Now, what can this now do? This has now its 3 prime position open. So, what can it do? It can now attach, attack another one with another base here. You can have GTP. So, what, when, what am I going to have here then? My base is going to be different, right? So, I am actually linking or polymerizing into forming a linear chain of the sugar phosphate backbone. You recognize why this is now a sugar phosphate backbone? Let us get back to the slides here. And what we are looking at is we have the 3 prime hydroxyl group here. What does it do? Attacks this phosphate of the triphosphate releasing the pyrophosphate with the cleavage of this anhydride bond. And what do you have? What is this? It is a dinucleotide now. Now, this 3 prime OH can do what? It can go and attack another triphosphate that has another base attached to it and it is going to then form a linear chain of the nucleic acid polymer. Okay? So, what do we have? We have a sugar of phosphate, a sugar if we have another linkage, another phosphate and so on and so forth. So, we have the polymer made that by linking nucleotides by phosphodiester bonds and how are these formed? They are synthesized by the attack of the alcohol residue from the ribose on the alpha phosphate to release a diphosphate residue. What is that? What is the diphosphate we are talking about? The pyrophosphate that comes off after this attack takes place. Right? then what do we have? So, we have this linkage. So, what are we looking at? We are looking at a 5 prime phosphate. It was this OH that attacked what? CTP, right? It attacks CTP and you linked T and C together. Is that clear? What you are essentially doing is you have a 5 prime phosphate here. You have the base attached by this glycosidic linkage to the sugar. Now, what is happening? This OH is free to attack the triphosphate. What happens? You then have the formation of a dinucleotide. But this OH is again free. What can that do? It can go and attack another triphosphate. 
In this case, it now has attacked ATP. This is adenine. So, it has, a, it has attacked ATP. So, we have now a trinucleotide which has the sequence T C A. So, just like we did in proteins, what do we need to know? We just need to know the bases that are attached because we and we just need to know the type of sugar. That is all the information we need. So, if we just right now, if you have looked at, I am sure you have seen books or just the DNA sequence. When you look at a DNA sequence, what do you see? Just A, C, T, G and so on and so forth. But what does that mean? It means that the structure is like this because you have the specific sugar, you have it linked by phosphodiester bonds in the sugar phosphate backbone. The difference lies in the types of bases that are attached are attached to the sugar. Just like in a protein, do we write the peptide bonds? We do not. We just write V, A, G, T, whatever. What does that mean? We have valine, alanine, glycine, threonine, but we know that they are linked by peptide bonds. It is the same thing here. We have the sugar phosphate. So, all the information I need to know is just what are the bases. That is all the information I need because I know that and I need to know whether it is deoxyribose or ribose and the strand has a direction that is referred to as 5 prime to 3 prime. This 3 prime can then attach another one and so on and so forth and you can have the increasing length of the nucleic acid okay, based on this. So, if we look at these base families, all the information you need to know is what is attached to what. So, if I say A, G, C, T, you know what it means. I say I have a linear polymer that is A, T, G, C. What, what do we know by that? First of all, you know it is DNA. Why do you know it is DNA? Because I have included T instead of U. So, you know what sugar you have to draw, you know what bases you have to draw and you know that they are linked by the phosphate backbone. Okay? So, now when if we just go back to the stru one structural aspect. So, now we know what this looks like, right. So, now you understand that you have the phosphodiester linkage. So, with the phosphodiester linkage what can happen apart from the sugar puckering which is going to change the orientation of the base. We can also have rotation about this that is also going to change the directionality of the bases. Okay? Now, how does that help or what can that do? Okay. So, once we have these bases, we can have base pairing. What is base pairing? Base pairing is when we have say a sugar, we now know that we have a sugar phosphate backbone. Sugar phosphate backbone. What does that, what does the sugar phosphate backbone mean? It means you have this and you have your T, right? And you have your base attached here. Again, what you are going to have is you are going to have one strand here and another strand here. Okay? We are going to look at how this happens later on. In base pairing, what you have is you have specific hydrogen bond interactions between bases, between the two strands. So, what is this strand made of? This is just the sugar phosphate backbone, right? This is the sugar phosphate backbone and we have basically the bases sticking out. So, when you see when DNA is actually drawn, it is just drawn with A, G and so on and so forth. Where is this coming from? This is linked to the sugar that forms part of the sugar phosphate backbone. <coughs> Excuse me. So, what do we have here? In between we have the phosphodiester linkages. 
here we have the sugar the base attached to the sugar so this is the strand of dna this is another strand of dna and what do we have we have linkages between the bases these linkages and this pairing is extremely important in the structure of dna we have here what is called watson crick base pairing now if you notice you have here guanine and cytosine what is guanine guanine is a purine cytosine is a pyrimidine right so you have a link between a purine and a pyrimidine if we look at the other base pairing we have adenine what is adenine it is a purine what is thymine it is a pyrimidine so we have purine pyrimidine pairing now in the pairing you will notice which is extremely important for the structure of dna we have hydrogen bond formation these red thick red lines are actually representations of hydrogen bonds now what are we talking about here we are talking about an oxygen hydrogen nitrogen here is one hydrogen bond here we have another hydrogen bond here we have another hydrogen bond so we have three hydrogen bonds in the pairing of g and c we have two hydrogen bonds in the pairing of t and a okay so now if we look at the structure what is going to happen when we have t at this position we are going to have a linking of the t with an a of the other strand right if we looking at a c here we are going to have this link with a g of the other strand if we have a on this strand it is going to link with the t on the other strand now if you look very carefully the pairing as i mentioned is between a purine and a pyrimidine a purine and a pyrimidine so there is one member of the pair that has a fused six and five membered ring being part of a purine family and we have just the six cn ring that is part of the pyrimidine family now this is extremely important if we look at the the distance between these two okay so we have an so what kind of pairing are we going to have we can have a t that is represented like that or we can have g c what does that mean it means you have two hydrogen bonds here and here you have three hydrogen bonds okay and we have purine and pyrimidine base pairing we have another type of base pairing the one that i mentioned before is watson crick base pairing there is another type of base pairing that is called hookstein base pairing now what do you notice here what is this what is that this is a is it a purine or a pyrimidine purine what is this it's also a purine okay so in this case you not only have purine pyrimidine base pairings you can have purine purine base pairings also but we will see how this is not seen in double stranded dna okay because double stranded dna you recognize if it has to form a uniform distance between the helices you have to have a purine pyrimidine fit in every case okay so when we have the two strands of the dna come together so we have one strand this way and one strand this way then the length between has to be the same so we have one purine that's of six and five membered ring fused together 
we have one pyrimidine that is a 6 membered. Okay, so, both of them coming together gives the exact distance that is the distance between the strands, but in the Hoogstein base pairing what happens you can have the base pairing between two purines. You also have purine pyrimidine base pairing, but since this is also possible you do not see this in double stranded DNA, but there are some cases where this is observed. Okay, but so far what we need to know is the basic pairing between the purines and the pyrimidines that form the basis of double stranded DNA, where we have three hydrogen bonds between G and C and two hydrogen bonds between A and T. Okay. So, if we look at basically adenine here, we have this phase which forms how many hydrogen bonds do we have with adenine? Two. A T right in the Watson Crick phase. Here also in the Hoogstein phase that is part of the 5 membered ring and the NH of the NH2. Okay. So, if we go back if we look at where this has formed you see this is a Hoogstein pairing this is between what? This is between the 6 membered ring here and the 6 membered ring here and in this case when we look at the A, this is between what? 2 A's or 2 purines. When we look at a normal Hoogstein base pairing, the difference between the Watson Crick pairing is let us look at the Watson Crick pairing. We have where is the hydrogen bonding? It is all from the 6 membered ring, right? In the Watson Crick base pairing, the base pairing that adenine forms with thymine is from the 6 membered ring, but you have a fused 5 membered ring. In the Hoogstein base pairing, so what did we have? We had this phase that was forming the hydrogen bonds in the Watson Crick base pairing. In the Hoogstein base pairing, we have one hydrogen from the 6 membered ring and the nitrogen taking part in the hydrogen bonding from the 5 membered ring. So, what we essentially have is we have what is called the Hoogstein phase, where it is the 5 membered ring nitrogen and the NH of the 6 membered ring taking part in the what is it taking part in? In the hydrogen bonding and for the Watson Crick phase it is only the 6 membered ring that is taking part. Okay, this is the essential difference in the pairing that occurs. So, when we have a Hoogstein, so what is this? This is a normal purine pyrimidine linkage A and U, U is found where in RNA. So, when we have an A and U linkage and you see that the linkage is between, obviously you are going to have it between two electronegative atoms, but you see it between what? or what, what is taking part? That is what you have to look at. What do we see taking part? Here we see the 6 membered ring taking part and we see the 5 membered ring taking part. So, what kind of base pairing is this? Hoogstein base pairing. Okay, that is essentially what we have to recognize. And when we see Watson base pairing in this case, what would happen? The linkage would be on this side because it would be the 6 membered ring that would be involved in the base pairing. So, we have a Watson Crick phase, we have a Hoogstein phase, okay? but by far it is the Watson Crick base pairing that is the most important. Okay? So, now essentially what we have done is we have looked at how we have the linkages of the two base pairs. So, we have A, T, we have G, C, 2 hydrogen bonds, 3 hydrogen bonds. These are coming from where? They are coming from our sugar phosphate backbone. That is essentially what is happening. Okay? And we have essential rotations about the backbone. Where are these rotations possible? We have the phosphate diester. Okay? So, if we have the phosphate atom here, we have rotations about this. 
we have the sugar ring somewhere here we have puckering about the sugar ring so now what is going to happen this rotation is going to this puckering is going to orient the g in a specific position this rotation is going to orient the overall backbone in a specific position what is that going to assist in that is going to assist in orienting the bases in such a manner that you can have the specific hydrogen bonding possible without this slight flexibility it would not be possible to have the hydrogen bonding you understand that because you have to have the nitrogen and the oxygen in the specific orientation specific distance requirements for this to occur okay and if you look at this result here we have a and t what is this base pairing what base pairing is uh, are we looking at here only the six member ring involved so it is watson crick if we look at the a and t pairing and the g and c pairing you see the distance from the c1 prime here and the c1 prime here what is the c1 prime it is where it is attached to the sugar the beta n glycosidic linkage that is where the c1 prime is what is the distance 11 angstroms when you have a and t when you have g and c it is also 11 angstroms so you see how nature has sort of designed it in such a manner that you would have a purine and a pyrimidine linked together you would have a constant distance here that would give you that is actually 11 angstroms that holds the bases together you have base pairing in such a way that the not only the distances but also the hydrogen bonding is complementary and you also have the flexibility possible that also makes it feasible for the hydrogen bonding too okay. thank you we continue our discussion on nucleic acids now what we learned last time was how we have these specific bases the purines and the pyrimidines interact to form with double bonded a hydrogen bonded structures how they form complementary bases basically okay so what we have here is if we look at the nucleic acids we know that they are now comprised of this pentose sugar a phosphate and a nitrogen containing base right and we know that this pentose sugar can be of two kinds either a deoxy kind or a ribose a deoxy ribose or a ribose depending on the type of nucleic acid that you are considering now obviously we have these two types a deoxy ribonucleic acid where what is missing at the two prime position the oh is missing at the two prime position and we have the sugar and the phosphate and the base families are the purines and the pyrimidines and what do they do they interact with hydrogen bonding a purine and a pyrimidine to form a basic two bases coming together in a hydrogen bonded network now there is an additional factor that has to be considered here that is the tautomerization possibility of the bases okay now if you look at the adenine consideration here what what do you have here you have an nh2 group okay now what can hap happen to that nh2 group is this h can you all know about ketoenol tautomer tautomerization what happens in ketoenol tautomerization what happens there you have a c double bond o and that is converted to an oh from a adjacent hch2 right so you have a ketoenol tautomerization here we are having an amino type and an amino type okay but the basic idea is the same where you are shifting this hydrogen in the case of adenine to the adjacent nitrogen in the in the ketoenol tautomerization what do you do you have the h shifted from the carbon to the oxygen right where you have a ketoenol tautomerization but what, what we are talking about here is an amino and amino case which is possible in adenine and cytosine and there are 10.5 bases per turn just like we had a certain pitch of the alpha helix it is similar to something like that when we have the a dna 
this is formed when BDNA is chemically treated. It basically does not have those water molecules in the water spine. That is what ADNA is and it has 11 bases per turn. The ZDNA as it is called is a left handed helix with 12 bases per turn and it usually plays a role in gene expression. So, these are the three forms of DNA and the most common by far is the B DNA. Okay. These are some of the features of the ADNA, BDNA and ZDNA. We have a pitch. What is this pitch? What is a pitch? The distance covered by one rotation. So, the ADNA pitch is 2.8 nanometers, the BDNA is 3.4 nanometers and the 4.5 nanometers for ZDNA. The base pair repeats are 11 bases per turn, 10 bases per turn and 12 bases per turn. The twist per base pair, you realize that there is a slight twist as you have the base pair like you would also have um, angle disposition for the alpha helix. These are the twists per base pair and we have a slight base pair tilt which is not very much in the BDNA just 4 degrees. Okay? That is a slight base pair tilt. So, the 3 DNAs we have the BDNA, the ADNA and the ZDNA and the most common structure that we will be considering is just the BDNA okay? that has about 10 base pairs per turn 3.4 nanometer and a base pair tilt of 4 degrees. So, that the double helix of DNA is actually well it would not be a secondary structure that is the structure of DNA, but there are other forms of DNA also. Our studies have shown that the native intact form of DNA can be linear and circular. If we look at the double helix here, if it goes straight up and straight down, we would have a linear structure. Now, what happens is if the two ends are covalently joined together, okay? so if we chop this up, we are going to get a linear form. 